Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome everybody to MIT's Faculty Forum Online. Uh, my name is Aviva Rutkin. I'm a master's alum from 2013 and a news engineer for Bloomberg. And it's my privilege to serve as your moderator today. This broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, just a reminder before we get started that after we hear from today's guest, we'll field your questions for her. Um, and you can use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar to ask your questions, and we'll do our best to get to as, as many as we can today. Uh, all right, let's go. I'm, I'd like to introduce everyone to Susan Landau. She's a PhD alum from the class of 1983. She's bridge professor in cybersecurity and policy at Tufts University, where she holds appointments in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and in the School of Engineering, Department of Computer Science. Professor Landau is here to discuss her latest research on cybersecurity, her thoughts on personal data in the age of COVID-19, and her career in academia. And um, we'll post her full bio in the chat now. And with that, uh, welcome Professor Landau, take it away. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, uh, I was delighted to get my PhD at MIT and uh, I'm not showing up. Is there something that, that needs to happen in order for me, the screen to come to me? I'm seeing you and hearing you, so. Okay, great. Yep. Um, um, I was delighted to get my PhD at MIT and uh, I have very fond feelings about the Institute. I wanna start with how I ended up at MIT. And to do that, I'll start with an ancient picture that some of you may recognize. Uh, this is Ravest, Shamir, Edelman, or rather Shamir, Ravest, and Edelman. Uh, when they came up with the famous RSA algorithm, I was teaching at a summer math program for high school students and Eric Lander, who's now at the Broad Institute, came and gave a talk there. And the amazing thing about the work from RSA is that it was mathematics that was accessible to this group of bright high school students who were doing all kinds of number theory over the summer. And so we could understand the mathematics completely. Uh, it was elegant, lovely, beautiful mathematics, and it was applied to a really important problem. Uh, I was tremendously excited by the, the work. And um, I was a graduate student in mathematics at the time at Cornell. But uh, I wasn't quite fitting as a graduate student in mathematics. I became more and more excited by computer science. And uh, I tried to do a PhD in computer science at Cornell, but it didn't have the right mix of things. And so I took a year off from Cornell, or actually I took my exams. I left Cornell thinking I would never, uh, I, would, I would do something else. And then I ended up back in graduate school a year later. And the way I ended up in back in graduate school a year later is that the New York Times ran some stories about the problems that Len Edelman was having about getting funding from the National Science Foundation because the NSA wanted to fund Edelman instead. The New York Times was running a science section and had just started a science section. And I decided I wanted to freelance an article on primes and cryptography for the science section. So I uh, started working on it and I called up Gary Miller who was a faculty member in the math department at MIT. And I said that I wanted a quote from him and I explained I was freelancing an article for the New York Times. And Gary was happy to talk to me, but he didn't understand how he could talk to me at all technically because I was freelancing an article for the New York Times and he did algebraic problems. And I explained that I had talked about his PhD thesis at both the algebra and computer science seminars at Cornell the previous year. So then he was much less interested in giving me a quote and much more interested in finding out if I wanted to go back to graduate school because he wanted somebody who knew both math, both math and computer science to work on a problem with him or to work on research with him. So I came home that evening and I explained to my then boyfriend, now husband, uh, that I could go back to graduate school. And he said, I know. And I said, no, I can go back to graduate school at MIT. Uh, and uh, this created lots of complexities personally because he was in the middle of an academic job hunt. Uh, but the short story is two weeks later, I applied to MIT for graduate school. Two weeks after that I uh, was in and two weeks after that I was in with funding, which is not the usual way you go to graduate school. 
So I got my PhD. I went on to a faculty position at Wesleyan. Uh, my husband uh, was at a faculty position nearby. One, he didn't get tenure, we moved. Life got complicated in the way that it often does. And in the middle of it getting complicated, I ended up as a staff person on an Association for Computing Machinery report on encryption policy. So I told you a little bit about NSA and NSF fighting about encryption, but encryption, uh, that was in the 1970s. They fought in the 1980s about, uh, NSA fought about uh, who should develop standards for, uh, for non-national security agencies, that is who should develop civilian standards for encryption, whether it should be the NSA or the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the civilian side won. In the 1990s, there was a fight over something called the Clipper chip. The Clipper chip uh, was a, an encryption system to encrypt uh, digital communications, voice communicate, digital voice communications. And the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, put together a committee uh, to do a report on the policy issues. I was hired as a staff person, but I became the first author. For those of you who have worked on committee reports, committee reports are very complicated. This committee included an assistant to the director of the NSA, members of civil society organizations, and there was lots of disagreement. There was disagreement not only about the conclusions, but there was disagreement about every paragraph in the middle too. So we had a probably 70 page report in which we were capable of spending two hours arguing over a single paragraph. At the end of the exercise, Diffie said to me, and Whit Diffie is the co-inventor of public key cryptography, the idea that you can exchange key information over an insecure channel like the internet and be able to communicate securely, which is really an amazing idea. So Diffie said to me in, in 1993, four, at the end of this ACM report, he suggested that we write the report properly, by which he meant write it the way he wanted or we wanted to see it written. And he said, it would take us three to six months to write a book. Um, well, I didn't think it would take us three to six months, but I didn't think it would take three and a half years, which is what it did do. After that, my career moved from proving theorems. And so I had been busy proving theorems about how fast you could do certain types of algebraic problems. I'd been an academic, a professor. My life moved after the book to working to, in, in, in industry. I moved to Sun Microsystems where, where Diffie was. I was supposed to be one third policy, one third uh, technical of interest to Sun and one third technical of interest to me. I very rapidly became a policy wonk. Um, after about five years at Sun, I realized I had become a policy wonk um, and that I was very happy and Sun was very happy and I stayed there. Um, and I worked on crypto policy I worked on policy regarding identity management. I worked on privacy and security. I worked on digital rights management. I served as a conduit between the technical part of the community of, of Sun and the policy people in Washington and Brussels. Um, and I would go to the policy people and explain uh, what new technology we were developing and what problems it would cause in Washington and Brussels. And I would do the opposite going the other way. And I behaved like a policy wonk because I started writing law review papers, which are remarkably different from writing technical papers. Um, in law review papers, uh, in technical papers, you write a paper and you send it off and they say, well, you haven't proved this theorem and this isn't quite correct, fix it. And then, uh, then we'll see about accepting your paper. In law review papers, they say, we're happy to accept it, sign this contract. And then sometime later, some second year law student sends you 150 or 370 corrections, which you need to reply to within 10 days. And when you do that, they send you another 370 corrections that have nothing to do with the first set. And you have to reply to that within 10 days. And what you're really learning how to do is be a lawyer, by which I mean, you find on Friday evening at six o'clock that you have a brief due in court Monday morning at 7 a.m. forget that, or 9 a.m. forget that hiking trip you had planned. So, uh, so there were many pieces of education. Uh, there was also education the other way, and I'll, I'll make a little bit of fun of, of, of writing law review papers. Uh, this is an MIT audience after all. Uh, one of the papers uh, that we submitted to a, a journal of a well-known university, let me, let me just say that the well-known university is in Boston, 
or Cambridge. Uh, this, this particular paper came back with a comment. It said, you say this happens so many times a millisecond um, and then so many times a day. Can you please explain that? So I wrote down, I was the lead author on this paper. I wrote down that there are a thousand milliseconds in a second, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day. I wrote out the entire multiplication. And I said, and if you make us put this in a footnote, we will be mortified. They didn't ask. Uh, we worked on that for a while. I worked at Sun when Sun folded and Sun was an amazing place to be, very smart people with a very high degree of ethics, uh, full of people who were excited about the technology they were building. When Sun folded, I moved around in academia and I am now at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, as well as the School of Engineering Department of Computer Science, which is a perfect place for me because I bridged the two communities. We've started a master's degree in cybersecurity policy. And aside from being too busy, I'm having a terrific time. My research spans both uh, computer science and law. Uh, I have continued to work in encryption policy. Some of you may know that encryption policy has been controversial since the 1970s. In the 1970s, the fight was over whether or not we should publish uh, in, uh, in from, uh, technical means of encryption outside the, the defense community. In the 1980s, the fights were over uh, standards and whether the NSA or the, or the civilian agencies should develop encryption standards in the 1990s, it was whether or not the public should be forced to use an encryption method that um, the keys were stored with agencies of the federal government. Now, the, the NSA did not say that the keys in the clipper chip would, would that, that uh, the public would be forced to use the clipper chip, but that was a direction the FBI was moving in. In 2000, the US government changed its direction and, and said that we could export strong cryptography. That is, we could export products with strong cryptography. This pleased the NSA because in exchange for loosening up on controls that pleased Silicon Valley, in exchange for doing that, NSA got funding for computer network exploitation, which is all the kinds of things you, you read about when you hear that the NSA has gotten into this piece of communication or that system and so on. The FBI wasn't happy. And for those of you who are following this story in the press, you'll know that the FBI has been pushing for, for the last 20 years for the ability to break into end-to-end -end encrypted communications, communications encrypted between the person who's speaking and the person at the other end, the person who's sending mail and the person at the other end. Recently, I participated in an uh, a Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace study on moving the encryption policy conversation forward. One of the interesting aspects of this study is that we included people from the national security agencies, people who are who are no longer at the government agencies because otherwise they would have to use the they would have to follow whatever the government was saying. But we had people from the ex deputy director of the NSA, the ex deputy director of the CIA, the uh, Obama's ex-Homeland Security Advisor, and we, uh, as well as the former general counsel of the FBI, people from civil society organizations. And in an attempt to move the policy conversation forward, we said, okay, what problem is solvable? Well, foreign intelligence seems to be able to manage to be able to, to find uh, ways to get into encryption uh, and to get to systems and to get to what they wanna do. And data in motion and data in rest, they're two different problems. Data at rest, the, the data sitting on a machine, the data on your phone versus the communication we have. And there's lots of reasons why if you make it easy for, for a government agent to get into data in motion, you're making it easy for everybody. So we said, let's look at the data and rest question. And let's look at it not in general devices and not in cloud storage, because in cloud storage at Google and at Facebook, it's encrypt, uh, the, those companies have access to the data in order to serve you better ads. Let's look at mobile phones. And, let's, and we, we broke down the problem to a place where we said, look, if you can solve this problem technically, if you can solve the problem in a way that there's good enough security for most people, and yet law enforcement is able to get in and get the data that they need to get to prosecute a crime or to investigate a crime, then we can think about laws and policy to control, um, to, to say when they should be designed this way. But if we can't even solve this easy problem, 
then forget it. Then we shouldn't try to restrict the use of encryption. From there, um, and the encryption problem continues. From there, I started thinking about metadata, about all the information that you can get from the to and from of phone calls, the to and from of email. What do you learn about the user? What do you learn about the device? What do you learn in what's called the IP header of packets? And I've been working on that and I was happily working away last spring when something happened. Uh, and that's something of course we all know about. And the issues I was thinking about in my technical problem very much apply to the coronavirus. At the, that is thinking about the privacy and uh, issues of learning about network of uh, uh, learning about what we call the metadata of communications. So I spent the last five months and I'm just about done, which is good because it's due next week. I spent the last five months writing a book on contact tracing apps called People Count, uh, Contact Tracing Apps and Public Health. It'll be published by MIT Press uh, early in the spring. I think February is our date. Um, and I urge you to, to read it, uh, but you have to wait till it comes out. The last thing that I wanna talk about before we move to Q&A is one other piece of MIT that, that pleases me immensely. So I went to school, I went to college and graduate school at a time where it was very common to say, girls can't do math. Oh, you're with the math team. Are you the cheerleader? And I would say, no, I'm the captain uh, and so on. One day about 15 years ago, um, I got a, a newsletter from MIT from the chair of the math department, Mike Zipser. And Mike wrote, and he said, if you have any ideas of things we might do, drop me a line. I was taking my dog out for a walk and I thought about it and I thought about, well, I'd started off, I've been an undergraduate in Princeton and a graduate student at Cornell. And then I ended up at MIT. Why was I able to finish my PhD at MIT rather than at Cornell? And I thought about the forms of support that MIT had for women students. The numbers weren't great. There weren't a lot of us and um, very few in the math department, few in computer science. And, and there was a chilly climate for women in computer science, but there was a president's assistant for women. There was a, a lounge for women. There were forms of support. MIT graduated its first woman in math PhD in the 1920s. Princeton didn't admit women to math for graduate school until late in the 1960s. So I suggested to Mike, that we have an MIT conference to celebrate women in math, which we did in 2007. And it was a wonderful celebration. And with that, I'd like to stop and open up for questions. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Um, before we jump in, I just wanna remind everybody that if you wanna ask a question of our guest today, feel free to drop it in the Q&A anytime. Um, and you can also look there and upvote questions that you like, and I'll try to, uh, to prioritize the ones that the crowd wants. Um, since I'm the moderator, I'm going to abuse my privilege and start with a question of my own. Um, you know, you mentioned that these fights over encryption and data privacy, this, this has been going on a long time, you know, and I'm wondering in the last few months, as you've been thinking and writing about the contact tracing apps for COVID, do you feel like you're seeing a lot of old problems that we've had to wrestle with before, or do you see new special challenges that these kinds of uh, applications, this kind of technology is posing? So the COVID apps, I thought when I started the project that it was more similar to everything I'd seen before. In fact, I think it's quite different. So the interesting thing that happened is Singapore uh, announced an app very early, Trace Together, in which, uh, so the whole issue with COVID, uh, the problem with COVID as we all know, is that uh, you don't show symptoms, uh, you, you can be infectious before you show symptoms and you pass it respiratorily. So two people on a, on a subway, on a plane, uh, in a classroom, uh, waiting in the coffee house, you're infecting somebody before you know you're ill. And, uh, and so the question is how can, and, and, and many, of these type, many of the exposures happen between strangers. So if somebody later learns, I, I am now infectious, oh, these people I was around, I should inform them that I was infectious then, they may be infected, so they cannot infect other people. They should hold themselves back, from, you know, they should isolate. Um, how do you do this? The, the Singapore app, Trace Together, does it in what's called a centralized manner. The centralized manner means uh, I have an app on my phone, Aviva has a map, uh, uh, an app on her phone. If I'm sick, 
my uh, so both of us exchange identifiers the phones exchange identifiers if we're within the six foot limit for 15 minutes it's a little more complicated than that but let's just say that we exchange identifiers and then if i get sick all of the identifiers on my phone get sent up to the public health agency which then is able to say oh there's aviva's identifier talks to me to find out whether i was actually just um outside with Aviva, in which case they're less concerned about it, or whether I was inside at a choir practice and we were, I was singing at the top of my lungs, in which case they're going to call her very quickly. But the point is they know that she and I were together. Privacy people, uh, lawyers, epidemiologists, uh, com computer science researchers were concerned about that. They said, what about an app which sends my identifiers up to this public health server and then the public health server distributes my identifiers and Aviva's phone looks and says, I collected that app. Um, oh my goodness, Aviva, you better isolate for the next 10, uh, two weeks. And that's called a decentralized system. So they solved the privacy problem. What they didn't solve were other social problems, the questions of equity and how this will work differently. The, the population of black Americans, for example, who are dying, the, the, the ratio of uh, the, the percentage of deaths per population is much higher for the black community. It's twice the rate as it is for the white community. Uh, the percentage of infections in places like Chelsea are much higher. And the question is, what's the impact of the apps in communities that are over-policed where ICE is very active? Will the apps be adopted? Will they end up uh, taking public health and making it less equitable than it already is? And so the issues turned into less of a privacy and security question and more of an equity question, which surprised me because that's not where I started. Let me, um, we have one of the top questions here is on another very uh, news pertinent topic. Gregory Greenwell wants to know, given the election on everyone's mind, he was wondering whether you could say a few words about the possibility of secure internet-based voting. Uh, forget about it. <laughs> and I wish I could do it in, the, in a Brooklyn accent, but I grew up in Manhattan. And uh, so, you know, why is it we can do banking online and we can't do, and we can, you know, buy books from Amazon or anywhere else online, we can't do voting. The point is we don't care about um, the information being public to the bank or anywhere else about uh, what we purchase. That is, we care about the privacy, but we do not care about the information being confidential, but votes need to be confidential because we don't want people to be able to sell their votes. And that complicates the process of internet voting tremendously. You want an algorithm that is secure, that doesn't enable somebody to sell their votes and is trustworthy. Can you design crypto that could do all those things? Quite possibly, except for the last one, which is the public has to trust it. And that's too hard. Um, and so internet voting does not seem plausible. Can you do internet voting for things that don't matter? I do it for the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science all the time. Uh, for the president of the United States, it's a different issue. Got it. Um, Bill Carlson, 68, wants to know, why do so many internet applications insist on real identity and real phone numbers instead of allowing or even encouraging pseudonyms to protect privacy and make right to be forgotten easier to implement? because your data is what they want. And uh, you know, do I notice that when I send a, a check to a political campaign, I don't have to put my phone number down. And when I try to do that online, which is more efficient, um, I do. So do I send the checks via, do I send my contribution via paper? Absolutely, uh, for exactly that reason. They're using your data uh, to market things, whether it's to market directly to you or indirectly to you. Um, so there are, applications that allow pseudonyms, um, but many don't because they find the data useful for their own purposes. Mike Nelson, um, class of 88, has another question about uh, keeping your data safe. He says, even if the FBI or NSA or GCHQ cannot read the content being sent over the internet, they can usually see who's talking to whom. Can Tor or anon anonymous remailers thwart such tracking? In general, yes. Um, so uh, the NSA has occasionally, as have other organizations, been able to de-anonymize even when somebody is using Tor. So what Tor does 
is through three hops. Um, it encrypts, uh, so if I wanna go to a web page, um, it encrypts my communication through three layers of encryption. It goes to a Tor web server, which unpacks the first layer, goes to a second Tor web server, which unpacks the second, third one, which unpacks the third and sends it on. The first one knows where it came from. The last one knows where it's going to, but nobody sees the whole message. By watching network traffic, um, if you're watching the whole country, and I believe um, there are places where NSA has done that, if you're watching the whole country in network traffic, you can sometimes de-anonymize. You can de-anonymize other ways too. But in general, Tor uh, does a, a quite effective job of protecting the privacy of communications metadata, and therefore who's talking to whom. And I should say that when the NSA gave up uh, on encryption back in the 19, late 1990s and traded, um, said, we want to do computer network exploitation, we'll back off on encryption. They got something that was pretty rich. Having the communications metadata often gives them everything they need to know. I'm going to jump to this question from Frank, which is a um, real blue sky one. He wants to know, has the law kept up with privacy concerns and cybersecurity efforts? And what changes to the law or even to the Constitution would you recommend? I'd be very hesitant to do a change to the Constitution. If I were doing a change to the Constitution, the one I would do would be on the Electoral College. Um, but um, I think any change to the Constitution would, is, is not where we need to go. The law has absolutely not kept up. A um, small example is in the to and from of email. That is not the equivalent of the phone numbers you dial. It's more like the card you do inside a package that says to my sweetie or to my son, or, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you're very pleased with the person you're involved with and you say something really nice on the card. Sometimes you're a little bit irritated and it's not quite so kind, but that's part of the message, which is something that card inside the package, which is something the courts recognized back in 1879. The FBI got it wrong on email uh, or either the Department of Justice got it wrong on email back in 2005 in its electronic surveillance manual and continued to get it wrong through 2015. But it's part of a bigger picture where they haven't kept up with new technology. So the NSA said, okay, in, back in the late two, uh, 1990s, lots of countries are encrypting their communications. It's not just the technologically advanced ones, it's everybody. We need to be able to understand what is happening around the world without necessarily being able to read the communications. We'll learn more about, uh, about what's happening through metadata and other means. The FBI said, no, we used to be able to wiretap. We need to be able to wiretap. And they haven't improved their skill set. Uh, I shouldn't say the FBI. There are some good people at the FBI, but law enforcement in general has not improved its skill set to the level it should have. Uh, so there's that. On the same time, there was a report released by um, a civil society organization called Upturn yesterday that talked about how 2,000 police forces have bought devices to, do, to open up phones. And there's no law that distinguishes between the files they're allowed to look at and, and not. Um, so there's many places. We need more restrictive laws we also need on, on, on police searches, but we also need more uh, technical capability by law enforcement. Yeah, there has been a few questions about that. Laura, for example, wants to know if there are solutions to law enforcement's legitimate concerns that, that don't compromise encryption. Um, and also, Paul, Paul had a similar question. He said, you know, if encryption is weak enough for the NSA to break it, doesn't that mean bad actors are going to be able to get in as well? You don't see the NSA or national security saying out loud, we need weaker encryption. Let's get rid of end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, quite the contrary, actually, when the Apple FBI case happened in uh, 2015, uh, law enforcement said, open that phone, we won't be able to investigate without opening that phone, open that phone, we won't be able to do this. And you had various members of the national security community, again, not people currently in government, because of course they can't say these statements publicly, but ex-NSA directors, ex-GCHQ director saying end-to-end -end encryption is really important. And in the case of um, the locked Apple iPhone, uh, Mike Hayden, who'd been ex-CIA and ex-NSA director said, locked phones are important too. In the current debate, you don't see national security 
uh, agreeing with law enforcement, at least in the United States. Um, so I guess there's another part to the question. So the other part of the, to the question is, uh, no, don't weaken encryption. Find other ways to investigate. Um, find ways to figure out what's going on without having to break into the phone. Um, we used to be able to do that. We can do that again. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. Well, when it comes to breaking into the phone, so we have a question here from Mike P who mentions a recent New York Times article on government agencies breaking into smartphones. It says they mentioned an American and an Israeli company that sells software that can break into smartphones. How do these companies do it? Do they use brute force, me brute force methods of finding a pass key? So this New York Times article from yesterday is about the report upturn that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, and yes, the companies Grayshift and Celebrite and others uh, use a combination of brute force. They Celebrite, I believe, started out as a company that uh, was fast about being able to transfer information from your old phone to your new phone by getting information from the company, the phone companies, Android and, and the, 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 the manufacturers, Apple and Android early to learn how to be able to do that transferring. Then they realized um, that there was a much better market in learning how to break into phones. And so they find vulnerabilities. Um, and, uh, and sometimes they have efficient ways of using brute force, but it's, it's largely vulnerabilities, I believe. Um, the problem there on the civil liberties side is that there are very few restrictions on how they can use the information that they find. That is, they open up the whole phone and maybe they really should only be targeting some small piece of it. Um, we have a question from Dee Guterman who wants to ask you about immutable or permanent databases. Is there any NSA or FBI position on whether immutable databases using blockchain methods are okay? Have you seen any discussion about this? I haven't. I'm going to take a pass on that one. I don't know. Okay. Um, well, then I'll jump down to this one I see right below it from Nat from Natalie, who wants to know if there's applications of cybersecurity that could help eliminate or at least significantly reduce spam robocalls, which I just received a few of this morning. So uh, I feel your um, pain. So, uh, I mean, they're, you know, we're, we're getting better and they're getting better. It's going to be a cat and mouse game for a really long time, I think is the answer. Given that they're randomly cycling through numbers to call you, uh, it's pretty hard. They hide what number they're dialing from. They hide more and more of the metadata to make it harder for the filters to prevent them. Uh, the better the filter gets, the better they get. Uh, and given that they're going randomly and you pick up the phone, it's not like they're asking to speak to you. They're asking, they're speaking to whoever's there. And I can't be the only one who deletes innumerable messages in Chinese on my cell phone. I do not speak Chinese. Um. We had a question, oh, there it is. Um, another kind of future technology question from Jay Taylor, who wants to know, will the power of quantum computing render all current encryption schemes moot in the foreseeable future? You know, I went to graduate school in the 1980s. Uh, and then we said that quantum computing was 10 to 20 years away. And here I am a lot of years older and quantum computing is 10 to 20 years away. If I were the NSA or the National Institute of Standards and Technology, I would absolutely invest in quantum computing. So the NSA is doing so, and that is in tools to, to deal with quantum computing. And the NIST is developing standards for quantum cryptography, post-quantum uh, computing cryptography, in order that we be able to do secure key exchange, even if quantum computers come. Those are both laudable and appropriate efforts. But, you know, I've been around a long time. I keep hearing quantum computing is 10 to 20 years away. So if it stays a constant, I'm not gonna worry about it too much. We also have a question in here from Richard Ross who signed as your former office mate. Um, he wants to know if you think truly anonymous cryptocurrency is a good idea. Truly anonymous cryptocurrency. Uh, you know, law enforcement follows the money. Uh, there's lots of time that following the money does really useful things, whether you're talking Watergate or uh, various types of, types of corruption. Uh, it's really useful to follow the money. I, I have trouble understanding um, in a non-corrupt society, in a corrupt society, if you're talking about Russia, 
different story, but in a non-corrupt society, I have trouble understanding why currency should be anonymous as opposed to communication. So I, I do strongly believe in protecting the confidentiality of communication. I have, I don't, don't see that truly anonymous cryptocurrency is something that supports a free and open democratic society. And hi, Richard. <laughs> um, we have another question here from Helene Eversbush. I hope I said that right. She wants to know about Bluetooth. Given that Bluetooth is notoriously porous, hackable, which organization would be accountable for damage due to a security privacy breach? And then she lists a bunch of, bunch of options. The app developer, the public health organization, the company that built the tools, third party re researchers. She wants to know, you know, what ramifications are there to motivate all of the above to keep data safe? Are there enough boundaries to keep everyone accountable? No, <laughs> that's an easy one. No, there aren't. I mean, we haven't, um, we have operated in a world in which there is no liability for software that doesn't work right. Uh, we've developed, um, as an example, we've developed the apps for proximity trace, tracing for contact, uh, for, for proximity tracing for, uh, for COVID, um, but we haven't developed in the United States any laws to go alongside it. What happens if your app tells you that, uh, that you've been exposed uh, what happens if your employer says to you, you need to run the app and you need to come in every day showing me that the app says you're clean, that nobody's exposed you. Well, for those of us who have the luxury and privilege of being able to do our jobs from home, no big deal, nobody asks us to do that. There are many people who don't have that ability, whether you're driving a bus or in food services, and yet we have no legal protections there. We have no way of saying, no, you can't require people to do this. Now, if we knew that the apps were absolutely accurate on measuring distance and distance was a, an exact measure of whether or not somebody would get infected and so on and so forth, we could have that public debate and whether or not we had a support for people who had to stay home because they've been exposed. Not everybody who's been exposed, of course, gets ill, but we don't have any of that social infrastructure in. So that's one part of the problem. But the part of the problem that Natalie asked about uh, what about protections? We don't have that one in either. And yet we can still have an employer say, can't come in unless you're running the app. And if the app says you've been exposed, you can't come in for two weeks. I don't wanna risk anything. And yet it's the employee who has to stay home and there's no recourse. Even if the app is saying you're exposed when the exposure happened from the apartment next door and the signal went through the wall. So I think we have a failure of liability law and also civil protection law, that's a different question from the one that Natalie asked, but we have a failure at many different levels. Um, we have another question up here from Mario Daniel about these contact tracing apps. You know, she notes that the apps, they only work if they have, these apps on phones only work if all the phones have the app, correct? And I've read that many of those apps are battery drained. So doesn't that impede contact tracing as adoption as well? So there are two different kinds of apps. Uh, they're the centralized apps and the decentralized apps. If the decentralized apps comply with what Google and Apple require, then they're not particularly battery draining. Uh, they've been designed in a way that they really minimize battery drain. That part isn't um, the issue. Can you remind me what the first half of the question was? Uh, she said that there, oh, I put it away, hold on. Sorry. Sorry. No, it's okay. I hide them when I answer them so that I don't see them anymore. Hold on one second. Um, Mary O'Daniel. Here it is. Um, they only work if you have it, and they're also battery okay. drained. So those are two points. So it depends on. Uh, so it's absolutely true that if I have the app and Aviva doesn't, and I am near Aviva, and then later I get sick, she has no way of finding that out unless we happen to know each other, and I tell her, and uh, and she realizes she's been exposed. Um, but there was a well-known study out of the University of Oxford that said essentially, if, uh, if you have 60% of the population running the apps, then that will, with all the other things we're doing, in, in, including manual contact tracing, bring the, the number of cases down to uh, where it will no longer uh, spread and it will slowly die down. That doesn't mean that if uh, I'm running the app and Aviva's running the app and nobody else is running the app, 
Aviva still gains if I'm running the app and I exposed her and she didn't know me, we're standing at the bus. Um, and later I get sick and she learns through her phone that she was exposed and she isolates, then the people around Aviva may not get sick as a result of her isolating. Um, so there is value. The question is at what cost, what resources are we putting there and it's instead of in other places? And um, is this the 311 problem, which may be an apocryphal story, but at the time that the phone number 311 was introduced for enabling people to call with minor civil problems, uh, as opposed to the 911 emergency number, uh, what we found, uh, I was not able to find this story online anywhere, but what, what the, the way the story goes is that people in rich neighborhoods were calling and complaining about potholes. People in poor neighborhoods were not. And the result was the potholes in rich neighborhoods were getting repaired first. Why? Who had cell phones at that time? wasn't the people in poor neighborhoods. So you drove over a, a pothole in a poor neighborhood. By the time you got home, you no longer remembered. In a rich neighborhood, you dialed right away. And so that's an issue there. But the app will stop some transmission routes. It, it just may not stop as much as we'd like unless it's widely adopted. Um, so Susan, you ended by talking a little bit about what it was like to be a woman and getting your PhD. And so I want to close out with some of the questions we have here um, about students today. Chris Clifton wants to know what you would recommend as a pathway for someone who wants to get into technology policy. And Chris is asking on behalf of a graduating computer science senior. Who's well, I have this stuff. marvelous program uh, at Tufts uh, in cybersecurity and public policy that we just started this fall. Uh, and I can't praise it enough. Uh, there are other schools doing other types of degrees. So ours is a, a, a 12 to 16 month master's, but you can go part-time, but done with the ad. Uh, but there are other schools that are also running programs. There are various civil society organizations in DC. It's possible sometimes to get an internship. It's harder as an undergraduate than as a graduate student. Uh, that's one route. There are routes, there's a tech uh, Congress, I believe is, is the organization has positions for people to work for a year in Congress. That is people who are technical graduates who work for a congressperson for a year, you know, looking at possible bills, doing analysis and so on. Um, and, and then of course, once you do that for a year, uh, you now have experience and it makes you much more employable. So I would say there are various master's programs, Georgetown, NYU, Berkeley, um, but of course the most interesting one is at Tufts. We are the only one that does uh, cybersecurity and public policy with an international focus. There you go. It's not just a plug. <laughs> um, let me get this last one. Simpson Garfinkel says, we still have a problem of female and minority participation in math and computer science. What should MIT and society at large be doing now to support women and minorities? Um, so uh, one is the sort of things that MIT has been doing for a while, which is the kind of infrastructure. And uh, so when I was a faculty member already, um, I'm going to forget the name of the, the woman biologist who did the, Nancy Hopkins, uh, I don't remember, who did the wonderful report that observed that um, women faculty had smaller offices, were on more committees and so on and so forth and changed things, including increasing the number of women faculty. Um, recruit more women as graduate students. Go and recruit at, um, at, the, uh, at the women's colleges. Go and recruit at the undergraduate institutions, which graduate more women. Recruit at the historically black colleges. Uh, those students may come, both sets of students may come with less of a background than somebody who's gone to a research university as an undergraduate, but they're smart and they wanna learn. And who cares in the long term if they take an extra year in graduate school? Uh, provide support for them formally and informally. Uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County has the Meyerhoff Scholar Program, which they've run for decades now, in which they do absolutely every step that you need to do to help people along. They bring the students in the summer before they start as graduate students in STEM. They run uh, weekly homework sessions so the kids are not isolated. Um, they, uh, sorry, these are students who start as undergraduates. They, they, um, find them internships in the summer. There are about a dozen different things they do. Their kids go on to have a higher rate 
of successful completion of PhDs at other institutions than the students who are admitted, who get into the Meyerhoff program, but opt to go to other institutions. So the idea is put in all the things we know how to, we know to do. Some will be more successful, some will be less successful, but MIT could do more recruiting, could have extra programs, could put effort into finding students internships, um, all these pieces. Teach the introductory uh, computer science class if it isn't already, where the applications have social impact as well as, you know, how long does it take this missile to go there? I'm exaggerating. I'm sure that MIT doesn't do that anymore. Um, but I, you know, I do remember a graduate course I took in statistics where the professor said, well, this will separate the men from the boys. And I thought, do I get up and just walk out now? I don't like this class anyway. Um, but there's all sorts of ways that, that women feel and, and minority students feel that they're not welcome. So you've got to work on those pieces as well as, as provide other support too. Um, well, Professor, on behalf of the Alumni Association, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Um, and I want to thank all of you who tuned in to the Faculty Forum online broadcast um, for listening and for asking your questions. Um, there are a few we didn't get to, but we'll be sure to forward all the questions that were asked today to Professor Landau. Um, and the staff will keep the chat window open for networking purposes for another 15 minutes. Um, this broadcast, if you want to share it, will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today's airing. Um, again, thanks so much and have a good rest of your day, everybody. And thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.